A friend of mine used to say, mostly, but not completely in jest, that the perfect Easter sermon would go something like this. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Let's go to lunch. Turns out, though, that the resurrection is about more than just a once-a-year celebration. It is the very heart of the gospel. Hello, I'm Stuart Baskin, pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Tyler, Texas. I frequently say, if you ever catch me performing a memorial service and I don't mention the resurrection, you have my permission to take me out back and give me a good thrashing. The resurrection is where the Christian faith lives and dies, literally and figuratively. It's the basis of our faith, and it informs everything else we believe and do. In his letters, Paul refers often to the resurrection, but it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he gives it his most thorough treatment. For most of this week, we'll be reading through 1 Corinthians 15. It's a lengthy chapter, but it is the most thorough discussion of the resurrection in the entire Bible. It is certainly appropriate to read through it on this week of Easter. Here's how the chapter begins. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you've come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe." There it is, the very heart of the gospel laid out in just a few short sentences. In fact, it is summarized in one sentence, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Let's think about what Paul just said. In his summary of the gospel message, Paul makes no mention of Jesus' life or ministry. Instead, he focuses on Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, let's be clear. Paul isn't saying that Jesus' life and ministry were unimportant, only that what Jesus said and did in his ministry were secondary to his death and resurrection. As to his death, Paul says not only that Jesus suffered death, but that he was buried. Now, for such a brief summary of the faith, this seems redundant. Why the detail about burial? Isn't it enough to know that he died? I'm reminded here of that part of the Apostles' Creed that deals with Christ's death, which says he was crucified, dead, and buried. Again, completely redundant. To be crucified is to die, and to be buried is to be dead. In effect, we're saying he was dead, dead, dead. Why? I suppose both Paul and the writers of the creed are countering any notion that Jesus only seemed to be dead, maybe was in some sort of a trance, but had not really died. Because, after all, if Jesus wasn't really and truly dead, then there is no resurrection from the dead. Second observation about Paul's summary. There are four verbs here. Died, buried, raised, and appeared. The first and last of these are in the active voice. Jesus did these things. He died. He appeared to various disciples. 
The middle two verbs, though, are in the passive voice. He was buried. He was raised. These indicate action on the part of others in which Jesus was the passive agent. Of course, others buried him. But the really important thing is that in the resurrection, he had given up control to God the Father. It was he who raised Jesus from the dead. No thought here of Jesus just sort of spontaneously rising again. It's a point, it is a pointed reminder that we too must give over control of our destiny to God, trusting, as Jesus did, that God is faithful and can be trusted to keep his promises to us. Final observation. Jesus actually appeared to people. Some of the stories we have in the Gospels, others have been lost to time, but his appearing to different followers at different times and places is our assurance that his resurrection wasn't just sort of a mystical fable. There were actual witnesses to it, witnesses who reported it. When we return tomorrow, Paul follows the trail of what it means if Christ had not been raised. But for now, may God continue to bless you and keep you in all that you do this day and in all the days ahead.